Thank you for being with us. And I'd like to introduce Diane Haynes, who will introduce Dr. Lee and our session for today. Thank you. Thank you, Julianne. And hello to everyone who's here today. It's wonderful to, to see you all. Um, it's my pleasure actually to introduce Dr. Scott Lee, who is currently an assistant professor at the University of Florida in the composition department of the School of Music. Dr. Lee has his PhD from Duke University in North Carolina. He has his master's from the Peabody Institute and his bachelor's from Vanderbilt. And the Gators, I think, won against Vanderbilt. <laughs> Sorry about that, Scott. Um, Scott has had many experiences in the field of music. He's led orchestras, including the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, the North Carolina Symphony Orchestra, the Peabody Symphony, and many others. He's also led chamber groups, such as the Jack Quartet and the DiCapa Chamber Players, as well as pop artist Ben Folds. And I don't know how many of you know about Ben Folds, but he must be quite a character. So that would be something interesting to hear about. Scott has received commissions from the Tanglewood Music Festival, the Aspen Music Festival, the Atlantic, Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra, and the Baltimore Classical Guitar Society. He's also won many awards, including the Morton Gould Young Composers Award, which he won twice, and the Charles Ives Scholarship from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Most recently, Scott was the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra composer in residence for the 2019-20 season. And he currently holds the position of the Bozeman Symphony composer in residence for the 21-22 year. He is actually the first recipient of that position. So he's the beginning composer there. Scott, it seems like is a young man on the way up and we are delighted to have him with us. He's known for writing classical music infused with instinctive sounds of popular music. His compositions have been called by critics colorful and engaging. So now let's all relax and we will enjoy this man and his music. Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Diane. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'll try to uh, address some of the, the things you mentioned in there as we, as we spend the uh, session together today. Um, you may hear in the background my 10-month-old uh, son making various noises. He's in the other room, so hopefully that's not going to be too loud for you guys. Um, but so thank you so much for coming and for the invitation to speak with you all today. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, and I uh, want to start by just telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am originally actually from St. Petersburg, Florida. So uh, I am a, a rare uh, foreign Floridian uh, and, and I'm still here in Florida. So, um, and I started in music when I was, uh, well, my, my parents were musical. My mom uh, plays piano and my dad sings and they met in high school in a production of Guys and Dolls that they were both uh, taking part in. So music was around the house and my sister uh, was taking piano lessons. She's uh, two and a half years older than me. And I wanted to take piano lessons because I wanted to do everything that she was doing. And so uh, I was younger, obviously. And my mom said, okay, well, you can take piano lessons, uh, but first you have to learn how to read. <laughs> so that was the stipulation. And so I started taking piano when I was five 
and uh, started to just make up some some pieces uh, in middle school, beginning around then. I think I was I was there was a talent show I remember, and I um, there was someone performing in the talent show playing piano, and they had composed the piece they were playing, and that was the first time I'd really been exposed to that, and I thought oh, that's something interesting to me. And also, I think I can do it better than that guy. So uh, there's a little bit of a, a competitive edge, I think, to some of the, uh, one of the reasons I started doing it, just to, to uh, get into that. But um, so then I, I got a little more serious in high school and, and, and then applied to colleges, both for music and for not music, and ended up getting into Vanderbilt to study composition and, and went there still thinking that I might do a, a double major in composition and something else like physics because uh, I was interested in, in uh, that field and uh, uh, ended up deciding that I was much better at composing than I was at physics and so uh, went all in and decided to uh, pursue a master's degree at, at the Peabody Institute which is part of Johns Hopkins up in Baltimore. Um, and so I was up there for two years living in Baltimore, and that's where I met my wife, who's a cellist. Um, and I'll talk more about our relationship later. Um, and then I, I moved down to Durham, North Carolina, where I was pursuing a doctorate from Duke, as Diane mentioned, and lived there for five or six years. Um, so then I... Um, I finished my degree at Duke and was teaching uh, as an adjunct at UNC Greensboro, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and at Duke, uh, just a few classes at each place, and was applying to jobs all over the country and, you know, just happened to uh, uh, get an interview here at the University of Florida. This was in 2019, and I, uh, you know, got offered the position after coming to do the the in-person interview and it all worked out. I think, you know, a lot of people's, uh, my parents still live in St. Petersburg and, you know, everyone's parents want them to end up, you know, getting a job close by and for academics, that's not usually an option, but it just somehow worked out and they're very happy to have me close by just a couple hours away. So I've kind of gone full circle, uh, around the mid Atlantic Southeast and have ended up near back where I started, which, uh, wasn't necessarily my intention, but I'm happy to be in Florida. Um, and so uh, to preface my presentation today, um, I know that uh, the model has been, uh, I know Dr. Richard spoke last week, I believe, and that there would be an hour presentation and then half an hour of discussion, uh, and it would be kind of separated like that. I'm hoping that we can incorporate the discussion as we go through the talk, and I will uh, invite you guys to ask questions at certain moments where we can reflect on maybe at the piece of, that I just shared and, and talk about it that way, and then we can move on uh, uh, as needed to, to keep going through the presentation. So when I, when I do ask you guys to, to chime in, if you wouldn't mind just using the raise hand function and then I can see, or, or if you wanna type something into the chat, that's also something I can see. So either of those methods would work great and then we can have a, have a discussion. Uh, Cause I really want to hear what you guys have to say and, and, and what you guys find most interesting uh, is, is what I wanna focus in on. So um, to sort of summarize my uh, compositional vocabulary, uh, I, I like to say that I, I write, or I try to write, viscerally engaging music that often takes inspiration from, from popular genres. Uh, this frequently involves uh, different kinds of grooves, like I've shown in uh, this slide here, interlocking grooves that uh, kind of fit together in, in these intricate ways. Um, and this can sometimes feature pointillistic orchestration. So uh, you know, little points of color all over the spectrum, uh, as well as extended performance techniques. So using instruments in ways that are maybe uh, slightly adjacent 
to the way that they're normally played or using uh, sounds that you might not expect to come out of a given instrument. And my goal with this is uh, with incorporating uh, uh, inspiration from popular genres is to reflect our current cultural moment while also building on the tradition of the past. And I try to do this by marrying the complexity of classical form, uh, the forms of music from classical uh, music history with contemporary popular music genres that are more visceral and immediate and more centered in the body and make you maybe want to dance or something like that. Uh, and my goal in all this is to create a, a complex music of the present with broad appeal. So you can assess today at the end of this presentation whether I achieved that goal, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a um, insight into how I think about my music. Um, so today I'm going to be discussing three pieces. Uh, the first uh, is uh, a piece for string quartet called Engine Trouble, which is from a, a movement from a larger piece called Through the Mangrove Tunnels. The second is called Vicious Circles, and it's a piece for orchestra. And then the third is a piece called A Certain Slant of Light for solo cello. The first piece I'm going to discuss is from a larger work, like I mentioned, called Through the Mangrove Tunnels. Um, this is perhaps my most ambitious piece, and it's an album length piece. It was released as an album uh, in 2020, and uh, it is for string quartet, which is two violins, viola and cello, piano, and drum set. And it's eight movements that are equal 45 minutes long. And I wrote it specifically for the Jack Quartet, along with pianist Stephen Beck and Russell Lacey who's the, the drum set player. This album was released, like I said, in 2020 on New Focus Recordings. You can say hi, this is Lily. <laughs> Speak in our language, Dr. Lee. <laughs> she has to just be in on the action, you know? So, um, this piece through the mangrove tunnels is actually, I thought it would be an appropriate piece to talk about because it's Florida uh, related. Um, it was inspired by my experiences growing up in St. Petersburg near a, uh, a nature preserve called Whedon Island. So I don't know if any of you have been uh, to the Tampa Bay area and have happened to go to Whedon Island, but it has a really colorful history and so the, the different eight movements of this piece are drawn from my memories of growing up there, as well as its own colorful history, uh, which includes a lot of different legends about uh, being a, 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 an important ceremonial gathering place for Native Americans. Um, it is rumored that there were certain conquistadors that landed in the area. Um, later in the 20th century, uh, there were a number of speakeasies that cropped up on the island uh, with property speculators trying to get people uh, to have a few drinks before trying to sell them property. There were shootouts between bootleggers. There was a, a, a failed movie studio that made three terrible movies, uh, uh, one of which, uh, well, Buster Keaton was rumored to be involved with the movie studio, but uh, after three movies, they got shut down for, for tax evasion. So not much came of that. Uh, there was a, a, an airport built on the island where the first commercial uh, flights in the US took place, which was from, uh, it was across Tampa Bay between St. Petersburg and Tampa. Um, there was a, a, a brutal uh, murder there that, was, uh, that took place. Uh, that is the inspiration of one of the movements of my piece. And now it's a, a nature preserve, and you would never know that all of this human history had taken place. It seems like it's always been this kind of natural landscape. But if you look closely, you can see the kind of uh, hints of the past that has occurred there. There's a line in the sand of the runway from the airport that used to be there. 
they found a dugout canoe, one of the longest dugout canoes in the whole uh, uh, in North America, they found in the mud uh, that belonged to a, a Native uh, uh, American tribe that lived there uh, hundreds of years ago. So all of these little elements of human history are still there. Um, and so uh, the piece evokes this history along my memories of growing up at this preserve where uh, there is a, a series of tunnels that are the result of ditches that the Army Corps of Engineers dug in order to try to control the, the mosquito population by allowing water to flush out the stagnant water of the kind of swampy landscape. It didn't really work because as you know, being in Florida, there are mosquitoes everywhere. And you can't really do much about it. Um, but now they've maintained some of these, these ditches and the mangroves have grown over the top as tunnels. And there are canoe and kayak trails that have been established. And I used to lead trips there uh, with a naturalist when I was in middle school and high school. And I would take groups of kids and groups of adults on the weekend, and we would go along these trails. So uh, this piece is, a, is an exploration of the relationships between memory, history, place, home, and the natural world. So even though we want to focus on the sixth movement, I want to show a little trailer video that I made um, when the album was being uh, released that has some footage that I took of going through the tunnels and it's paired with uh, uh, the opening of the first movement, which is the same title, shares the title of the album called Through the Mangrove Tunnels. So I'm going to share this screen now, this video, and we'll watch this short uh, uh, clip here. So uh, that was sort of the, the opening music of the piece meant to evoke the swamp and have a, a kind of, uh, there are these flashbacks that occur to different memories of mine that uh, sort of take you through the portal of, of these tunnels to a different place. Um, the, the sixth movement, oh, this is one of those, move, uh, the movements is called Playthings of Desire, which is based on the film that was made at that, uh, that movie theater that failed, uh, the movie studio that failed, excuse me. But we're gonna be focusing on the sixth movement, which is called Engine Trouble. Um, and this is inspired by a personal memory of mine. Um, I grew up on a canal that leads out to a bay that borders this preserve. And my dad would sometimes let me take our boat out to fish with, with my friends. Um, but the engine wasn't unreliable. It was a secondhand boat and it wouldn't always start. So uh, at the opening of the piece, you hear the engine running smoothly and it's represented by this motoric groove. Um, but the engine breaks down in three different ways over the course of the piece. Something gets stuck in the motor, causing it to lose steam. Uh, it builds up more momentum only to putter out again. And then there's one final attempt to get the engine running. 
Um, this movement employs noisy string gestures and extended techniques to create this kind of motoric uh, uh, visceral groove. And there are a lot of glissandos that the string instruments play where they slide from one note to the other. Duh, just like you can slide with your voice, right? But often I have them actually bowing the string rapidly while they're glissandoing. So you get this kind of and that's the kind of sound that you're going to hear. Um, there's a lot of sort of noisy effects to scratchy kind of sounds that you can make by pressing with a lot of pressure on the string and you get a kind of eh sound. And I thought that was a really good sound to use when you're evoking a kind of engine, right? That involves noise. Um, and I thought you might be interested to hear uh, some of the ways that I came up with this piece. Um, I, I often uh, will use my own voice to improvise little musical ideas and I'll record myself on my phone. And I often get my best ideas when I'm in motion, either when I'm walking around or when I'm in the car or something like that. And I'll record myself and then try to then put it in instruments later on. Um, I also will uh, often try to, to play the ideas myself. I have a violin, I'm not a violinist, but I can try to play a few of the ideas that I came up with. And in this piece, I uh, uh, used a combination of my own voice and myself playing on the violin and recorded them and used a computer program where I could layer them on top of each other and get a kind of mock-up of what the piece might sound like and manipulate it so I could actually hear some version of what I would actually come up with, as opposed to, to uh, using pencil and paper. I do that too, but just not with this piece. Uh, and working at the piano, let's say, um, because a lot of the sounds that you're gonna hear in this piece don't really translate very well to the piano. And the piano would be a limiting factor in the composing of this piece. So um, let's go ahead and uh, we'll watch a video of this piece. And I'm sure you guys have, have some questions that have cropped up uh, during this whole first part of the presentation. So the piece is about six, six and a half minutes long. And this is a video of not the, not the group that I wrote the piece for, but a different group uh, playing it in Providence, Rhode Island. The video starts out a little bit shaky at first. They're trying to get the camera set up, but then it kind of settles in. So I apologize for a little bit of the shaky camera, but I figured it would be better to have a video rather than just play the audio for you guys. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. And uh, as you might have heard in the piece, uh, the engine, as I described, broke down a few times and uh, maybe looked something like this uh, in, your, in your mind. Uh, but um, yeah, I think now is a good time to pause my presentation for a little bit and solicit any questions. I saw that we had one hand raised. So now that um, Elizabeth unmuted first. So Elizabeth, did you have a comment? I was going to applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, right. Elizabeth. Richard, go ahead. Okay, I think I'm on. Yep. I guess, uh, you know, after hearing Paul Richards and um, who used uh, kind of Ives type of uh, melodies uh, to introduce new themes, I see where you're uh, using English words uh, to introduce themes. And it's kind of like uh, if you don't have any um, tonality or uh, folk songs or something like uh, Ives used uh, to get the meaning over, uh, you used English. And I, I think that um, it, it really helped to, to understand uh, the English uh, engine breakdown breaks down is um, uh, did uh, give a forecast like a theme, musical theme. And it's kind of uh, an interesting way to think about it is you can introduce uh, uh, themes, not just from music itself, but from English words. And so you think of a libretto and some kind of uh, movement towards uh, more use of English in your compositions and towards opera. And just like for you to comment on these suggestions if they're um, reasonably true. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, I think there's a tradition of using, uh, uh, you know, what some might call program music, right? Music that has a specific narrative and composers have sometimes gone as far as to include a specific narrative uh, story that accompanies a piece. Uh, some of the famous examples might be uh, uh, Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, right, where each movement has a has a very clear program, a story that right. is being told in the music, somewhat literally, right? Like a uh, tour of the of the um, musicians. I mean, of the museum where you got this uh, uh, very strong themes of uh, Orientalism uh, coming with a great gate at Kiev. <laughs> right. And there's there's a whole middle ground, too, of, you know, Peter and the Wolf or, or stories that even have narration that are very explicitly telling you a story. And then uh, uh, pieces like Picture as, at an Exhibition, where there's a story of you kind of walking through a gallery, right? There's a promenade theme of, of the action of walking, but then there are these movements based on the, the, the paintings. And it might be just an impression that that painting gives musically, right? It might not be a literal story that it's telling you about, you know, someone doing an action, right? And so uh, uh, there's a whole kind of spectrum along there. And so, you know, uh, for me, this whole, through the mangroves piece has uh, uh, varying levels of narrativity in how closely there is a story being told in certain movements. You know, this is somewhere in the middle where you hear the engine running, you hear it breaking down. In the middle though, it's just kind of music, right? It's just music that's happening and that's I'm hoping to make interesting music. So it is really, I find it fascinating the way that that narrative and music can interact in very explicit ways, but also some ambiguous ways. So I appreciate your comment, Richard. Um, I got another uh, question uh, uh, privately from Jan uh, uh, Lowenthal um, asking what the score looks like, and if there are any special marks necessary for plucking and all the slides. And yes, there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, notation that had to be kind of uh, uh, worked out for that. 
uh, I mean, one of the benefits of the of this is that I could uh, pull that up pretty quickly right now. If you guys are interested in just, I know some of you might not be uh, uh, comfortable uh, looking at sheet music, but it might be interesting to to just take a quick glance at that. So you can, I can answer that question uh, with a. Uh, but the picture, because pictures are worth a thousand words, right? Is that what the the saying is? Hold on, just give me a second to pull it up. And so hopefully you can see this now. Uh, and that opening gesture, I don't even specify all of the notes that they're going to play because they're just sliding between them. And then I give them different... 16th notes, right, which is them using the bow to make a, a sound, even though they don't know what note they're going to be playing at that moment, right? And so then there are different ways. This is a, a, a plucking. It's a particularly strong plucking. It's called a snap pizzicato, where they pull the string so far back that it rebounds off of the fingerboard and makes a really snapping sound that you probably heard. And so a lot of these uh, kind of noisier gestures have interesting notations, right? And then something like this, where I use note heads that are just X's that say, it's explained elsewhere, but it's it's a scratch tone where they play eh, 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 something like that. And so there are, there is a lot of sort of uh, uh, unconventional notation, but certainly there are composers that do much stranger things with notation than I'm doing in this, because it's more or less, uh, uh, most players would would understand how to to navigate this so but thanks for that question dan um now i might go back to the presentation any other questions before we we move on okay so i want to move on to talking about vicious circles now um so this was a piece that I, I had an opportunity to write for the North Carolina Symphony while I was a graduate student at Duke University. I was selected to have a reading by the orchestra, which is basically not a public performance. Uh, I Basically, we had a rehearsal that was split between a few composers where they would rehearse our pieces and run through the whole thing just so we could hear it and get feedback and get a recording that we could use privately. It's since been performed by a few different orchestras. Um, but my intent with this piece was to take full advantage and showcase the capabilities of a symphony orchestra. And so uh, this piece therefore consists of, uh, of a series of variations uh, that have a, a passacaglia like structure. Now, some of you might not be familiar with what a passacaglia is, but it's basically a repeating idea that you vary. And unlike a theme in variations, where you have a full uh, theme and then you vary it very like uh, uh, each variation is more or less self-contained. Like I'm thinking of Mozart has a variation on, on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, right? And you hear the whole melody of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Then you hear a whole variation that lasts about the same length. A passacaglia is a little bit looser than that. And the, the thing that you vary could be a bass line. Or it could be something uh, um, uh, a little bit shorter than a full theme or melody, right? So um, the title, Vicious Circles, uh, uh, comes from the idea of a vicious circle. Uh, and I like to illustrate this with a quote from The, the Little Prince. So the book, The Little Prince, and he's speaking to a drunkard. And he says, why are you drinking? And he responds, in order to forget. To forget what? To forget that I am ashamed. Ashamed of what? Ashamed of drinking. Right? So a vicious circle being something that uh, the, the, the solution is also the cause of the problem. right? And you can't escape the vicious circle. And so that relates to the piece in that there is this cycle of, of, of repetition that keeps occurring throughout. Um, and I was also inspired by a passacaglia from, from Peter Grimes, an opera by Benjamin Britten, which is a very famous passacaglia 
uh, it's the fourth interlude of that opera. Um, so, but mine is, is slightly different from a traditional Passacaglia, which is typically a bass line. So you would vary this repeated bass line. Uh, and then in, in the Peter Grimes, it's something like bum, 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 bum. And that repeats over and over and over again. But on the top of it is a series of variations. Um, but I wanted something a little more flexible. And so I developed a kind of series of notes, a pitch series that is kind of a mel melody, but isn't necessarily a full melody, but I can take this series of notes and I can stretch it and I can compress it and I can do all sorts of things, change what register it's in, whether it's high or low. And so I wanted to, to just go through this kind of quickly for you guys so you can hear the structure of how I, how I crafted this piece. Um, so it starts with this 22 note series that I'll play at the keyboard here that hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear. So it's more or less in a kind of E minor key, but a little bit, uh, it strays from that. So um, this is the, the skeleton of the piece, but the, even the first time you hear it, it's a little bit embellished. So I'll play this, this musical, this is the very first presentation of that series. And you can see that there's a, sometimes a few more notes that have been added between these 22 notes to kind of make it a little more complicated. Something else to, to uh, uh, take note of is this, these 16th notes uh, are, are being alternated by the string. So some of the strings are going bugadum, bugadum, bugadum when you have 16th and some of the others are going Bum, ba -ka -bum, ba -ka -bum. and they composite together to make this 16th note four notes in a row, but it gives it this kind of 3D effect that I like. So you'll hear more of that as we go through. So the next time, the first variation, you could call it, uh, you'll see that uh, it's expanded down to a low E. So we'll hear a lower note, and that's the process that this takes. We start in the middle and we work our way down. So each time we get a lower and lower start to this. Uh, and you'll see that there have been more kind of insertions between some of the notes, right? It gets a little bit longer. Between notes 12 and 13, we have this little interlude. And the same thing between 16 and 17, and the same at the end. So it's starting to expand a little bit. So I'll play this. <laughs> And then as we get to the, where'd my mouse go? Uh, the second variation, it's further expanded and it gets further down. There's a bass line that starts to emerge out of the notes of this series. And you start to hear the harmony accompanying it. <laughs> So it's starting to get a little bit harder to hear the, uh, the, the, the series because sometimes the notes are jump up an octave, right? Whereas before it was, now it's, right? Where they're changing octaves and it's, it's uh, becoming less of a melody and more of a skeleton behind the melody. And then for the third variation, we're getting further afield and we're getting down to this low E. And then I think there's one more to show you guys, uh, the fourth variation where there's a lot more insertions happening. This whole passage happens and we don't really have the fifth or the sixth notes. So it's starting to kind of be freely varied where I just kind of ran with it. 
and wanted to create just create engaging music. And I wasn't so worried about being tied to that skeleton that I started out with. And you might have also noticed that there is this cyclical nature to this repeated pitch series. But within that, there are these smaller little cycles where you have repeated uh, uh, gestures that get kind of stuck in a loop, right? And so there are these different layers of cycles that are happening on top of each other. Um, so I'm going to play a video of this from the premiere, which is uh, was given by the uh, a, a, an orchestra called Symphony in C that's based in New Jersey. And I won a competition with this piece that they premiered it and uh, uh, and, and gave a performance of it. So, um, and you'll hear there's this opening section built on this series, like I've just mentioned. And later you'll hear a second theme that's more lyrical, but is also built on uh, that same kind of motive coming out of this series. So if this is our, our original idea, the lyrical idea start, starts out like, so it's, it's related as well. And you'll hear that as the second main idea. Um, so I'm going to go and move to uh, the video here. This performance is uh, uh, almost 10 minutes. So, and, and the video, uh, all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this and then afterwards I'll take any questions that you guys have.
All right. So um, now would be another great time to pause and ask for any questions you might have had about that piece or anything else that I've brought up or any reactions you might want to share. Do you want to call them or do you want me to? Yeah, sure. I'll call them. I see Shirley uh, has her hand raised. I just wanted to say your music is so fantastic and it looks like it's so difficult to play. But you lost me when you were going out in your boat and the motor kept breaking down. I'm the daughter of a fisherman and I know exactly what you're talking about. But I then began to, I got lost. You carried me there. And then I thought, what would it sound like to have music put to the experience of a fish being caught and the experience of the fisherman catching it? The two different opposite emotions, the chasing of the bait fish, the jumping up in the air of the fish and the running off of your drag line and the reeling it in and then the ecstasy that you've caught something and ended a life of a fish. What would that sound like in music? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a, a, a great, you know, there's a lot of drama in that whole interaction. And, and I wonder whether, I don't know any pieces off the top of my head that uh, are specifically, you know, <coughs> fishing related. There is a movement of that prior piece through the mangrove tunnels that's called flying fish that is supposed to evoke the, the mullet that leap out of the water yeah, in, yeah. in Tampa Bay that, that just sort of there, you don't catch mullet with a, a hook and a, no, and eat them because they're, they're bottom feeders and they, or they eat on algae and things. But anyways, yeah, yeah, that would be quite a, a, a dramatic uh, inspiration for a piece. But you catch a great combination of environment and mental attitude. Terrific. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Shirley. And thanks to Dale, I, I see you, you loved it uh, uh, in the background or in the chat there, I see. Okay, I see uh, uh, Don, I see your hand, and then Elizabeth and Richard. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, you mentioned earlier uh, being influenced in effect by uh, Peter Grimes, Benjamin Button piece. Uh, in his introduction to the orchestra, uh, or Bartok's concerto for orchestra influence you in any way, as you can see this wonderful piece we just heard. Uh, yeah, actually, Bartok's concerto for orchestra was a huge inspiration generally for me. I, I, I uh, in high school, that was a piece that I was in an IB music class, and we had to focus on that piece for two years because it was the wow. piece that we we're going to have our, our IB exams focused on. And so we listened to that piece so many times and I love that piece. And it has all of these, you know, the, the featuring of different sections of the orchestra in different ways. And so along with Britain's uh, uh, a Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, that kind of like, here's how the orchestra works and let's showcase what it can do. That's certainly what I was going after in the piece. Yeah, thanks, Don. Uh, Elizabeth, you want, you had a hand raised? Well, I, first of all, I was going to say bravo to the conductor. W that wasn't you, was it? No, no, that was Stylian Kirov. Uh, he was the, he's the music director of the Symphony in C. And my question was, when you first bring in the, uh, the bass line, are you starting with your 22 note series there and following it? Uh, throughout, um, you know what I mean? I think so. It, it, it's maybe not a process that has a, a clear uh, rule or structure to it. It was maybe more intuitive. And uh -huh. so I had this kind of series of notes, you could call it a, a melody maybe. And then I just kind of kept finding different ways I could mess with it and vary it. And I realized at a certain point, oh, if I take this note and put it in the bass, then I can start making this bass line, right? And so it wasn't any kind of like process that I followed that had a rigid kind of structure to it. It was much more- Anyway, I, I loved uh, it. <laughs> say it again. I loved it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Richard, I see your hands raised. 
I, I hate to introduce uh, uh, financialism to this process, but I'm kind of curious as a young conductor. Uh, and of course, you get the, your university salary, but how do you get compensated for these development years? Uh, is it by the number of uh, symphonies you're uh, allow, uh, uh, chosen to do, or how does uh, uh, the compensation from your music um, vary over time? And I don't quite, I mean, it's not like do you have a, I'm familiar with, you know, uh, uh, country and western or some thing they would they will get some label to give them support and their fun their financial function was kind of like uh, how many albums have they produced how many what were the sales of the albums but i have no idea what a young composer uh, of uh, classical and other kinds of music uh, gets compensated and makes a name for himself other than performances do you get paid back for by performances or by recordings? Sure, yeah, that, that's a great question. It, it is opaque uh, to a lot of people, you know, outside of music, but even to a lot of people inside of music, how do composers make a living, right? Um, a lot of composers can't really survive on composing music alone. There's, there's only a few that really can do that, um, you know, ones that are particularly well-known, uh, you know, someone like John Adams or Philip Glass, right? Or, uh, um, you know, the, the uh, Eric Whitaker, someone like that, where they've got enough music that they're writing and enough people asking the right music. And so f a lot of composers have, you know, teaching jobs, right? And, and so when I was, before I got at the job at UF and before I was teaching adjunct at different colleges, you know, as a doctoral student, you get a stipend, uh, and that was, you know, the main the the main source of income for me. But for writing music, uh, there's you know commissions. So when uh, say the Bozeman Symphony asked me to write a piece for them, um, and they we agreed on an amount that they would pay me to to write the piece and that commission also included you know they would fly me out and put me up and do all that kind of stuff um and then uh i also have a uh, an agreement with uh, uh broadcast music incorporated bmi who is a performance rights organization and so anytime a piece of mine that's registered with them gets played uh that organization has to have a license with that group. And then I get royalties for a live performance. And so every university like UF has a license with BMI and with ASCAP that a blanket license that covers everything that they pay a certain amount for. And then anytime that they play a piece and it gets reported, then the composer of that piece gets a certain amount of, not a lot of money, but some money. And it can add up the more performances you get. So hopefully that gives you some idea of how that starts to work. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I see Diane has her hand raised. Yes, Scott. Um, you said that when you were in high school and I guess starting college, you were thinking about a major in physics or in composition. Right. And I, I wondered if your knowledge of physics, you must have taken some courses in it, I would think, um, has any influence on your um, ability to compose music, uh, and why or why not? Would it have an influence? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there are obviously a lot of things in common between the fields. I mean, when we're talking about um, how sound works, right? And we're talking about how the overtones, when you play a low note on the piano and you have not just that note sounding, but all the notes that are vibrating in concert with it at the same time, you know, those kinds of technical acoustics properties, uh, I think it really helps to have a background where I can understand that and try to take advantage of that. I wouldn't say that plays into moment to moment decisions I'm making as a composer. It plays into broad ideas where, you know, you might not want to put a chord very low in the orchestra because it's going to sound muddy. You want to put it in high, which has 
to do with acoustics uh, and properties, but you don't need to know that. You just need to be told that as an orchestrator and, and the reason behind it doesn't really matter. So there are some things that certainly help me understand the why of, of things happen in my pieces, but I'm not sure whether on a moment by moment basis, it has such a huge impact. Uh, you know, there's often a, a link between a kind of, people like to talk about math and music and physics is a lot of math, right? And so there's a part of my brain that likes to solve puzzles and solve equations and things. And so I think part of that might play into it as well, where I like to create these structures that have, you know, motives and ideas that recur and, and come back and, and interlock in certain ways over time. So that might be the biggest way that it actually manifests that relationship. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll move on to the last piece now and uh, uh, we can talk about that. So the last piece I'm gonna play for you is called A Certain Slant of Light. And I wrote it in 2020. It was commissioned by the Florida State Music Teachers Association. Um, they commission a composer every year. They select a composer in Florida and I was selected that year to be commissioned to write a piece. And it was uh, meant to be performed at their national conference. Uh, as you can imagine, that year the conference went virtual, so it was done by a, a virtual performance. But I wrote it for, for my wife, uh, who's a cellist. Her name's Emily Austin Smith. And um, uh, she, she's played a, a number of my pieces and has, has given me feedback during pieces that she hasn't played during the composition process. But this was the first piece that I wrote expressly for her to perform. And so the process of the composition was actually collaborative. I would bring her uh, uh, certain ideas uh, uh, or short sections to try out. And then she'd give me feedback like saying, that Boeing doesn't work, or does it have to be that fast? Or how about an octave down? Uh, and every once in a while she would say, wow, somehow all of that seems to work. <laughs> Uh, and so the result is a piece that's true to my uh, original conception and it's difficult, but it's ultimately playable uh, because I had her input during the process. Um, and so uh, the, um, and the material for the piece is actually, uh, the notes is actually derived from the letters of her name. I sort of translated the letters into notes to get an idea started and went and used that as my starting place. Uh, and fittingly, the poetry, the title of the piece comes from the poetry of a different Emily, Emily Dickinson. Uh, and and uh, a certain slant of light calls to mind uh, visual imagery that the music evokes, uh, perhaps glinting light off of the surface of the ocean or fireflies flitting about in the darkness. Um, and so I will play a video of this. It's about nine minutes long and uh, uh, you might not be able to tell in the video, but uh, my wife is actually a few months pregnant in the video. And uh, when she was learning the piece, she had quite a bad run of morning sickness. So you would never know she's playing it so well. Uh, but now our son is, is 10 months old. So it's interesting to see how the timeline of this, when this video is made, we did it in our house here. So uh, I will pull this up now.
right. So um, that is all the music I have to play for you. We have just a few minutes left. And so if you have other questions uh, or comments, I'd love to hear them now. Diane, yeah, I see your hand. Yes, um, as an old cello player, um, I love the last, of course, and Elizabeth is also a cellist. We both play with the uh, chamber music group here that I see Mike Plout is here with us. He got us all together. Oh, wonderful. So um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and also for sharing the three different modes uh, that you compose in. It's just wonderful, thank you. I appreciate the, the kind yeah, words. It looks like um, Don has a question. Yeah, Don. Don, I just wanna echo Diane and thank you for taking time from your very busy teaching schedule to to share your wonderful music with us. I'm so glad you accepted U.S. invitation to come mm -hmm. here, to return home to Florida. Well, thank you so much. I, I am glad too. Um, I just wanted to add one other footnote, kind of a coda, if you will, to this presentation. Uh, in response to Richard's question about how do composers, classical music composers, how are they compensated? How can they support themselves? And what I would like to say is that American universities really are the modern day Medici's, if you will. Without American universities and their wonderful music programs, we wouldn't have the kind of music that you and Paul Richards have shared with us and that we're going to hear the rest of this class. In fact, I read a statistics not long ago that something like 90% of all classical music being composed in this country has its roots in the affiliation with the university someplace. So that's how important it is that the University of Florida and similar programs support their arts programs. I just had to add that, had to get a plug in. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, it wouldn't I wouldn't be able to to do what I do without that support and without the, you know, security of, of the position at, at UF. So that's a great point, Don. Um, I wanted to also mention before I forget that uh, Vicious Circles, that the orchestral piece that I shared, I just uh, a couple of weeks ago finished a, a version of that for Wind Symphony, and the UF Wind Symphony is going to be performing that in February. So uh, uh, not the ideal uh, uh, COVID uh, situation with a bunch of wind instruments blowing in the air, uh, from students uh, coming from the dorms, but uh, uh, I invite any of you that are interested. Um, I think that's taking place February. I, I can look up the date. I don't know whether they've posted that uh, concert yet, but um, let's see. It's uh, February 15th. It's on a Tuesday evening. So um, it, it was an interesting process to try to translate that to from a string heavy orchestra to all winds. So you can come see what that sounds like. And I'm also in the process of trying to set up a, the premiere of, of Through the Mangrove Tunnels in St. Petersburg, hopefully for some time a year or so from now in uh, 2023. So I'll be sure to send any uh, of that information to, to Don and, and Julie to pass on to you all so you're aware of those uh, those performances. But And I'd love to, to see you at a performance at UF when they happen. So thanks for your your kind words and all of your interest in my music. And I see Julie has is, is raised her hand. I was just wondering if you knew if there might be a Zoom link to stream. That's a good question. I don't know, but if that is the case, I'll definitely pass that on. But- okay. um, Are there any other questions? Um, just uh, send our- a big, great big thank you to Scott for being with us today. Yeah, thank you all. And I will, uh, I, I have a website, it needs updating, but uh, if you're interested, you can go uh, uh, find more music there. I'll post the link in the chat. It's just my name, scottleemusic.net. Uh, there's a mailing list you could add yourself to if you wanted to get updates. I don't send things out very often, but occasionally 
and and there's my email and, and contact information on there, which uh, you can also uh, I'll pass it here if, if you have any interest in, in getting in touch about anything. So uh, feel free to 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 do that. And uh, uh, thanks again for your for listening to my music and let me share it all with you. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone. Again, Dr. Uh -huh. Lee, stay well, everyone.